So last day, we were talking about adaptive immunity and we had introduced all of the parts of adaptive immunity and we had gotten down and we just started talking about humoral immunity. And I think we finished off in this slide. So I showed you that, uh, that cool video uh, with the, uh, I think, Australian guy and he was talking about clonal selection and, and showed what happened during uh, a strep throat infection. And uh, so I want to just talk about that for a couple more minutes and then uh, contrast that with cell mediated immunity. Uh, there is a really nice video for this as well, but it's kind of long, so I'm not going to show it. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, uh, there's a link on the PowerPoint. Maybe I'll see if, about, uh, if I can upload it to um, the Facebook group as well. Uh, and it is kind of worth watching. It just goes into a lot of extra detail that's not needed, but uh, you can see the, the difference in the response anyway. So humoral immunity, right? Humoral means blood. And uh, so it really just means um, secreting antibodies in the blood and in the lymph is really what uh, is going on. And there are different, uh, like I said, there's sort of different ways to do this. If you remember the video, we have those B cells secreting um, antibodies and antibodies were binding to, I think it was the M protein on the streptococcus and all that. Uh, that's not necessarily always the way this response works. Uh, what's going on with my mouse here? Oh, there we go. Uh, often um, this response is also involving those dendritic cells. So if you remember those dendritic cells, I had kind of equated them to being a little bit like security guards that, uh, you know, if they see something suspicious, they might hold on to it and, uh, and then just, you know, allow other immune cells to kind of make the decision whether to activate an immune response, right? Uh, so often they're holding on to an antigen, a part of something, and they present it, and sometimes they're called antigen presenting cells. And um, it's really the, um, the B cells that are getting activated and are gonna do something about it. So you can see step number one is a dendritic cell is grabbing onto it. Really, bottom line is there's an antigen that is uh, recognized as something that's foreign to the body. Uh, the B cell is what recognizes the antigen and then it's gonna get activated. So what happens when it gets activated? Uh, it clones itself, so that means the cell undergoes mitosis and now there's a whole bunch of uh, duplicate copies of that cell. Some of them become active cells and the active cells secrete antibodies and some of them become long lived memory cells. And we'll talk a little bit about memory cells when we get more to um, uh, vaccination. Uh, memory cells uh, can last for years. Um, we don't really fully understand why some memory cells last maybe five years and some memory cells will literally last decades. Um, and that's part of immunity in terms of uh, some of the things we don't understand. But the memory cells are good because they're going to be important for if we ever see that thing again someday. So what happens when we secrete antibodies? All that stuff that we talked about before with antibodies. The antibodies find the antigen, and that either leads to phagocytosis directly, so opsonization, or sometimes it leads to them agglutinating and clumping, which often leads to phagocytosis. Uh, it can lead to neutralization of that target, so that target is uh, less effective at binding human tissues, which often leads to phagocytosis. Or in other cases, um, it may lead to other types of killing, which we call cytotoxic killing, uh, which doesn't involve phagocytosis, but usually involves uh, uh, in injection or application of toxin by uh, natural killer cells and uh, other, um, other cytotoxic cells. And uh, um, the one thing that's kind of being skipped over here, as I mentioned before, in terms of the interaction of all the different cell types in the immune system, there are T cells that sometimes are responsible for activating the B cells. And, there are other cytokines and, and um, immune molecules that are important in this whole process as well. So kind of the main thing to know, right? With the humoral response, it leads to activation of a B cell. The B cell secretes antibodies, and those antibodies are gonna do their job in hopefully destroying pathogen. So that's really the humoral response in a kind of very basic, uh, at a very basic level. So let's talk about the cell-mediated response, um, which is kind of the other arm. And like I said, you know, we can sort of think of these as separate, but there is some overlapping um, attacks. And I know with um, uh, talking about uh, the new vaccines for the coronaviruses, 
um, you know, you might see in the news, people are talking about B cell responses and T cell responses. And it turns out with something like a virus, uh, actually both parts of the immune system um, are active. A virus particle is small and can be destroyed by phagocytosis. But if you think about the later stage in a viral infection, the virus has now infected a cell and it's hiding inside a cell. And often that human cell is too big to kill by phagocytosis. But during part of the replication process, that uh, virus is going to um, get that cell to produce uh, viral glycoprotein, so the spike protein that, that um, everyone's been talking about. And that is something on the surface of that infected cell that can be recognized by our immune system. So the T cell response is, is looking for things that are, that are too big to kill by phagocytosis. And that really fits three categories. These virally infected cells that have, uh, usually they're looking for viral glycoproteins. Um, sometimes we're talking about uh, large pathogens such as parasitic worms or certain protists that are just massive. Uh, you know, like I said, there's just many different types of these things. And the other prong is um, other abnormal human cells. And that usually fits in the category of cells that are, uh, are um, cancerous or potentially cancerous or tumor forming, that kind of thing. And so that's kind of where the, 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 uh, um, the cell mediated response comes in. Cell mediated meaning it's killing cells directly, not necessarily killing smaller particles. So like I said, there's a video here at seven minutes. I'm not gonna play it. You can check it out later. It's pretty good, just very detailed. Um, and uh, uh, it's linked to the PowerPoint. And, uh, but it's very good if you're interested in, in looking at that in, in, a, in a nice animated kind of way. So here's the uh, typical cell mediated response, right? So you've got an antigen. This time it's activating a T cell, okay? Um, so, you know, because it's, it's a bigger thing, right? So T cell is getting activated. And what happens when a T cell gets activated? Uh, T cells are a little bit more, um, they can be a little bit more lethal because they are in some cases killing human cells. So they're regulated a little bit more tightly and there are things called helper T cells, which are part of that regulation. I'm not gonna ask you about helper T cells, but just know that there is a bit more regulation when it comes to the, uh, cell mediated uh, immune response. Um, so what happens when they get activated? Um, some of them become long lived memory cells and some of them, they don't secrete antibodies but they become cytotoxic, right? Cytotoxic means cell killing, right? Cyto is cell, toxic means killing. So just a different way to do things. B cells secrete antibodies, antibodies lead to um, killing the, uh, the pathogen or destroying toxin or something like that. Um, T cells, when they become activated, they do the job directly uh, and they become cytotoxic um, by uh, injecting toxins or, or that, uh, that kiss of death process. Like I said, there's different processes in terms of how cytotoxic cells can do the jobs. Uh, so here's kind of a little comparison. You know, you have the humoral on the one side and the cell mediated immunity on the other side. And um, so you can see, uh, for example, on the left side, the humoral immunity, we're looking at smaller um, pathogens, right? So you've got some little bacteria there, it looks like, uh, maybe some little viruses, I'm not sure what those are, are, are supposed to be representing, but smaller pathogens uh, and sometimes toxins. Um, the B cell response can, uh, um, can neutralize certain toxins like the diphtheria toxin, that's something most people are vaccinated against, uh, can be destroyed by uh, by antibody binding. On the right, you can see it says we've got an intracellular microbe and that leads to the activation of the T cells. So on the left, you can see the, the killing is phagocytosis. On the right, the killing is by a, a cytotoxic cell. So little compare and contrast there. Uh, so there's the notes, right? B cells, antibodies secreted, um, deactivation and phagocytosis. Um, cell mediated immunity, you've got T cells, uh, larger pathogens, and they're killed by, um, by cytotoxic effects. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the immune response, right? A few more things to kind of talk about. I want to get into some memory cells and a few other things. Uh, like I said, this is extremely complex. And, um, you know, every time I, I pull up the textbook, I realize there's, there's so much more that could be discussed, but we're not going to get into all of that. So do focus on what I have in the notes and the PowerPoints and what I'm saying in class in terms of what you need to know. Okay. 
Okay. If you have any questions on clarifying that, please let me know. I know it's very easy with the immune system to get bogged down in the details. They're kind of crazy. Uh, this is kind of showing um, some of the interaction and a little bit of a flow chart. I found it was just another way to kind of talk about the immune responses uh, in this flow chart. So if this helps you a little bit better um, than those other slides, then great. Um, I kind of like flow charts myself. Um, and uh, if you like to, by the way, here's a study tip, right? If you like to make flow charts in, uh, in your notes, um, our brain likes things to go up and down, left and right. So avoid diagonal lines. That's that has one way to help your brain remember. We like, you know, we like to read left and right or right and left and up and down. We don't like to go diagonal. Diagonal things are really hard to remember in your brain. So organize things nice and neatly, and that's going to help your brain remember with your study tips. Um, this is uh, kind of just showing, uh, this is from the immune or the, um, the textbook. And uh, just again, the point I've already made, things are more complex. And you can see this is sort of an updated more modern model of the immune response. And you see all these, all these complex interactions. And uh, so no surprise, right? Our bodies are very complex. The immune system is, is amazingly complex. And there's, there's really much that we have to learn. Uh, and uh, I'm learning things all the time. Uh, and every time I read about new discoveries, um, there's always something that amazes me. Um, yeah, okay, same, same uh, concept, right? They're working together. And uh, this is just um, an infographic I found dealing with um, the coronavirus, right? And just talking about the different types of immunity, but I'm not gonna dwell on that anymore. So I want to show you this. This is from the first edition of the textbook. I thought this was kind of a nice graph showing that for different pathogens, you're activating different uh, parts of the immune system and different types of antibodies. And it kind of depends on what exactly you're looking at. Um, so for example, you can see uh, these viruses, right? Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, in many cases with viruses, um, it's, it's really strongly um, the T cell response. A lot of viruses, you know, they get in your system and they're found in such small quantities, the B cells don't get a, get a chance to be activated. So it really is the cell mediated response that is kind of the primary thing. A lot of bacteria, particularly things that are not intracellular bacteria, you're looking at more um, B cell humoral responses. And then there's some overlapping as well in between. Uh, and that's kind of really the, the main point I wanted to make here. Okay, so let's talk about those memory cells. And one of the big things we want to talk about today in terms of immunity and uh, long-lived immunity and those kind of things. So memory cells are long-lived. Um, like I said, there's, there's, there's not really a great understanding as to why some memory cells seem to be really long-lived and some are kind of... Um, you know, six months to five years, some are decades, right? So I'm assuming all of us are too young to have been vaccinated by smallpox, but uh, maybe you have a parent or a grandparent that was, I think you have to have been born in Canada before 1970 who have been vaccinated with smallpox. And um, there's studies and these people are still, they still have um, memory cells. This is incredible, that's like 50 years. Um, whereas other things, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, recommending boosters every five to 10 years and those kind of things. Some things are not well understood. And this is one of the big questions that's going around with the new vaccines in terms of the memory and all that. Uh, and uh, the answer is we don't know, right? You know, I mean, most of us have been vaccinated for less than six months. Um, we have a few people, a uh, few studies that kind of show one thing and a few studies that kind of show a couple other things. Um, the science is not fully there yet in terms of the boosters. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more here um, uh, in a few minutes. So these memory cells, if you take a look at this, this is showing what's happening with your immune response. Um, the first time you're exposed to something is called a primary immune response. So let's just take a look. That's the top chart there, all right? So the first time you get exposed to something, um, it takes a few days. Right, you can see that the average response is about four to five days before the uh, antibody level actually start to rise in significant numbers. So this means that um, you know, and this makes sense, right? You, you, you get the you get the illness. Um, it takes a few days for those B cells to start to clone themselves and secrete antibodies. That kind of thing takes time because technically, if you've never been exposed to something, you might only have one or two B cells in your entire body that are able to recognize that particular antigen. 
uh, eventually will take care of itself and the typical immune response is somewhere around two-ish weeks, right? Um, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and, and usually it's not, um, um, it, it's pretty good if you survive, obviously, um, but the, the overall amounts of that primary immune response um, compared to the secondary response are actually quite a bit less. So the secondary response, meaning you've been exposed to something, now you have those memory cells and those memory cells are really good at being activated super fast. So you can see in the secondary response, um, those B cells are activated almost immediately and the response is that day. So this means often with the secondary immune response, we don't even know we've been exposed to that particular pathogen. And um, uh, the, uh, the antibody levels are much higher. And, uh, and uh, in many cases, like I said, you have no idea you've ever been exposed to it. Um, one, of the, one of the most effective vaccines out there is the, the measles vaccine. And uh, the measles vaccine is so effective that people, um, it, it's, it's not even possible to detect secondary infections, right? It just acts so fast and neutralizes the virus. And um, so it's just very quickly. Uh, some, some vaccines may be a little less effective in terms of, you know, you still get infected, but you don't get symptoms and that's detectable. And, uh, you know, but that's all, all part of this whole thing. But the good news is, like I said, you're not usually getting sick or ill at all. And, um, um, and because of uh, the really rapid and robust uh, response. So let's talk about immunity in general, right? In terms of, uh, you know, what immunity means. Uh, usually immunity is, uh, is uh, broken into four categories and uh, want to talk a little bit about each of these uh, particular categories. Um, first type is natural immunity. So what is natural immunity? Um, it is where you get the actual infection. So as I mentioned before, um, chicken pox, uh, this was a rite of passage for almost everybody. 95% of everybody uh, before the vaccine was popular um, got chicken pox by the time they were age 12. And um, most people would have um, a decent immunity that would last for decades, uh, often until you're about 60, until you, you might get shingles. Um, but other than that, um, you know, it's, it was a pretty good immunity. Um, and uh, um, there's, there's a child there with, with, um, with chicken pox. And so before the vaccine, by the way, you may have heard of this kind of thing, um, some parents were thinking, okay, uh, you know, I want to have my child immune to chicken pox. It's less severe when your child is young. And so this was a strategy that uh, some parents would use to um, uh, get their child immune against chicken pox. And these chicken pox parties, these are illegal, by the way. Um, chicken pox is usually not that serious. I'm not sure what the exact stats are, but one in 10,000 children would actually die from it. That's not huge. Um, and then a certain number would get uh, serious respiratory infections. Um, but most people would get the blisters and that would kind of suck. They'd be itchy, you'd get a fever. Um, if you had a blister on your face, that could leave a scar. Uh, my one son uh, has a, a scar right um, in his eyebrow. And um, so you can sort of see there's no hair growing if you look carefully in that one little patch in his eyebrow. He got chicken pox, believe it or not. He was just about, he was supposed to get vaccinated. Um, he was scheduled like a month later to get his vaccines. And, uh, but he got chicken pox, right? So um, he got it before he got the vaccine. Uh, and there were people selling chicken pox laced um, suckers on Facebook at one point. Um, that is also illegal. <laughs> um, please don't do it. Uh, now, chicken pox is one thing, but there are people that try to do these things around more serious diseases as well, and those are also legal. But like I said, it is a strategy, and um, uh, in the case of something like chicken pox, there is a little bit of logic to it in terms of trying to get somebody uh, to have the disease while they're young before, you know, where the likelihood of the illness being very serious um, is, a, is a lot less, right? Uh, adults who get it uh, tends to be a little bit more serious and more... Um, uh, more severe. Um, so there is some logic in that kind of thing. But uh, but don't do it because it's illegal for one and and, uh, and we have effective vaccines for number two. Uh, what's going on here? So my mouse is doing something weird. There we go. 
So second type of um, natural immunity is called passive immunity. And uh, this basically means mother to child. Uh, and there's two types of, of, uh, of this passive immunity. One is through the placenta. So during the actual pregnancy, there are antibodies that can cross the placenta and give some immunity to that child. So whatever is floating around, um, you know, whether it's influenza or whether the mother has uh, vaccinations against certain things, that's going to give that child some protection. And uh, um, the other type of protection is through the breast milk. There are some antibodies that go through the breast milk. So at the beginning of this pandemic, by the way, there was questions about, uh, you know, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what do you do with, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 and mothers and, and, and breastfeeding and, and what if uh, the mother gets sick and those kind of things. And, and um, you know, there's still some debates around that, but the, there is a lot of benefits from, from, um, from breastfeeding. And this is usually uh, uh, after birth, those antibodies can last for weeks to up to about four to six months in some cases um, and, uh, and give the child protection, which is about the right amount of time because it takes a good six months after birth before that child's immune system really has a chance to sort of start to develop and, uh, and start to get some immunity of, of its own. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons why breastfeeding is, is um, uh, encouraged in, in many cases, uh, but uh, because of the, the immune protection. So third type of immunity is artificial immunity. In this case, we're talking about vaccination or sometimes we call it immunization. Um, the words kind of mean the same thing. And uh, this is where, uh, and we're gonna talk about vaccines here in a moment, but really the whole idea is you're giving the person something that looks like or gives an immune response to the actual pathogen. So in this case here, what you're looking at is a child getting the oral polio vaccine. So the oral polio vaccine is actually a weakened version of the virus. Uh, doesn't uh, usually make people sick at all, no symptoms, but it does give immunity against the real thing. And that's what's going on there. So we'll come back to vaccination in a moment. Uh, the last category is something we call artificial passive immunity. So what does that mean? Um, this is where you can actually give someone antibodies. So you can see on the left there, that image of the guy getting bit by a snake, right? So usually it doesn't happen around here. I don't think there are even snakes in Fort McMurray. Never mind if there were, they're probably not poisonous. But if you're down uh, like in Lethbridge, they have apparently rattlesnakes down there. So what happens if you get bitten by a rattlesnake? That's bad. Um, the, um, the ER in Lethbridge has rattlesnake um, antivenin. And so what is the antivenin? It is basically antibodies that will protect you against that toxin. And so in many cases, it's made in a horse. Why a horse? A horse is a large mammal. They have a lot of blood. So what they do is they, they take the horse, um, sometimes other animals, and they just inject initially very, very tiny non-lethal amounts into the horse. And then they, they bring that amount up and, um, until the horse has a robust immune response against the, uh, the venom. And, uh, and then, like I said, a horse is a large animal. You can take a liter or two of blood very easily, and it, it's not a big deal for the horse. Um, and then you can extract those antibodies and then keep them in a little vial. So when that person gets to the ER, you can, um, and they're you know, suffering from that toxin, you can inject that, give them IV antivenin, and it will hopefully neutralize that toxin uh, um, and give that person a, a chance of survival. And so there's a whole bunch of these out there. And uh, depending on where you live, your, your ER may have um, access to, to, uh, to different uh, types of, um, uh, of uh, antibodies. Uh, there's another type of artificial passive immunity that uh, has also been used in some cases, and this is called convalescent serum. This is something that was experimented around a little bit with Ebola. This is a really old method of giving someone immunity. Um, so this was, this was done with Ebola um, back in 2015. Um, you have this scenario where somebody gets sick and they survive. Awesome, right? Um, and so uh, this is actually an opportunity. What you can do, what is going on here? So what you can do 
is borrow some of their blood, right? And, uh, and same as the horse idea, uh, except for now it's a human who's had the disease. You can borrow some of their blood, give them some of the serum, which is gonna have antibodies against the virus, to give the ill person a, a fighting chance. So you can see in this case here, they're talking about, um, there's a talk about doing this kind of thing with COVID-19, and this was from, um, I can't even remember what the source was, and uh, initially on at the beginning of, of the, uh, the pandemic. So there's another way to do this as well. We do have the technology to make artificial antibodies as well. And uh, there's a few of those on the market. I think I have, um, yeah, I have some of them listed there. Uh, some of them now are not fully approved in Canada. They're sort of at that stage of they've been, you know, um, conditionally approved and, you know, and, and there are being used for therapies. They have weird names. You can see what's this name. Bam, lamb, I can't even say that, <laughs> right? The last two letters are AB, right? MAB actually stands for monoclonal antibody. And they have, um, there's trade names. I think one of them is called, um, what was it called? Uh, Covab or something like that. I, I mean, there's a whole bunch of these out there and they've been hitting the news a lot. Um, and uh, one of the issues with these is they're expensive and it's, ta and it's taken a little time for Canada to get some of the supplies on these. But apparently now they're available for people that are quite ill and uh, they're basically injecting uh, you know, by IV, these antibodies to uh, protect people that have, uh, have gone into um, uh, a hospital for, for serious COVID. So kind of cool. Like I said, I'm not going to get into how these artificial antibodies are made. I think there's a little bit of a, a blurb in the textbook about it, or you can ask me some other time. Um, kind of interesting technology. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, vaccines, okay? Um, there's a whole bunch of different types of vaccines out there and it's worth talking about these things. And uh, we'll start off actually talking about where the word vaccine comes from. Um, very interesting history of science moment um, is, is this moment here uh, done in a painting. This is uh, Edward Jenner and um, he was a uh, countryside doctor and, and he had spent a number of years kind of uh, tracking down some of these stories um, and I don't think he was actually the first person to have done this, um, but he was someone who uh, he spent some time learning about it and then eventually did it and, and, and started publishing about it. And uh, so what he had heard was that uh, a milkmaid, so a milkmaid is a woman who would milk a cow back in the day. And uh, he had heard that milkmaids who had been sick with cowpox never got smallpox. So what is cowpox? Cowpox is a virus related to smallpox. You'd often get some blisters and maybe a fever and that would be it. No one was dying from cowpox, but people were dying from smallpox. In fact, uh, the, the mortality rate from smallpox was 60%. I don't even know what we would do if we had a pathogen like that nowadays. That is absolutely horrifying. Um, so here he is. What do you do when you have this theory? You grab a small boy and you, you do experiment on him, right? Um, uh, you, you know, this is bef before a time where we talked about ethic, you know, medical ethics kind of thing. But he had very good reason to believe it was going to work. So he tested it and it worked and it became popularized and became the first vaccine. So vaca is Latin for cow and that's where we get the term vaccine from. So we sometimes we call it vaccine, sometimes we call it immunization, all kind of means the same thing. So what is a vaccine? Vaccine technically is a preparation that is gonna give you immune response and hopefully that immune response gives you immunity against the real actual pathogen or disease when it comes. I just wonder if there's a question there, let me see. So someone's just mentioning that mumps can give uh, lifelong immunity too. Yeah, it kind of just depends on the actual vaccine. And there's a, there's a lot we don't understand. So I want to talk about, I'm going to get a bit different clicker here. It's just a wireless mouse. So there's several types of vaccines I want to talk about. Um, and it's important to learn a little bit about each of these things. Um, two years ago, this list only had four types. Uh, and now we have six types, uh, and they're all worth uh, talking about. So the oldest type is the first one there. 
attenuated. So what does attenuated mean? Attenuated means weakened. And um, so way back when um, uh, Edward Jenner was using uh, uh, cowpox, it's a kind of a related virus and sort of a different category in general. We don't usually do that. But um, um, Louis Pasteur was using this, this method to make some of his vaccines. And he was taking pathogens and weakening them. And he didn't really understand the mechanisms of what he was doing. Uh, nowadays, we have several mechanisms for weakening uh, microorganisms. Uh, I'm not going to get into all the details on that. Some of them are genetic mechanisms. Some of them are, uh, are methods for uh, producing in the lab where you just keep growing them in the lab until they mutate and get weaker. But they're, they're still able to grow. So an attenuated vaccine is sometimes called a live vaccine, or sometimes they put both words in there, live, attenuated. And the whole idea is you're giving somebody a virus or a pathogen that can, um, can still grow and replicate in the human body, but um, either at a really slow rate or it's just not very pathogenic and it's not gonna make the person sick or the symptoms are gonna be very, very mild and they're not gonna get the severe disease. Uh, this has some advantages because this thing will replicate and uh, in some cases it will replicate for years and give up and, and constantly stimulate that person's immunity and they can have a long lived immunity. Um, there's a whole bunch of examples of these. You can see the polio vaccine. Uh, OPV stands for oral polio vaccine, by the way, also called the Sabine vaccine. I'm going to come back to polio in a few minutes. Um, another one is MMRV. So MMRV is mumps, measles, rubella, varicella. Right, varicella is chicken pox. It's all in one shot. It used to be just MMR, but they added varicella, I don't know how many years ago, six, 10 years ago, I don't know at what point they added varicella. Um, another one is the flu mist. I uh, haven't seen that in a couple of years, um, but that used to be an alternate to the flu shot. They had offered it for, um, for children, usually children who don't want to get that big needle in their arm. And uh, um, it was uh, a nasally, uh, sort of this thing to stick up the nose and, and uh, nasally approach applied and it was also an attenuated um, vaccine. So these ones um, are usually pretty good. And um, um, this is actually the strategy that, that China and I think Russia used for their COVID-19 uh, strategy. Uh, definitely China, I'm not sure Russia, I'd have to look up to see what their, um, what their strategy was. But like I said, it, it's uh, tried and true, it works. The biggest deal is you have to grow up the virus, often in large quantities, and, and, and sometimes there's technical challenges with that kind of thing, um, but it does work. Okay, still problems here. So another old method is to kill the thing. So you grow it up and you can kill it by, uh, you know, sometimes boiling it or adding uh, formaldehyde or uh, you know, other techniques like that. Those are kind of the, the main methods, some sort of chemical uh, um, deactivation um, molecule. Like I said, formaldehyde or, or related compounds used to be pretty common um, or sometimes boiling and whatnot. Uh, and uh, here's some examples. So the, the regular flu shot, the one that you get in your arm is actually the killed uh, flu virus. Um, the injectable polio virus is also the killed version. And that's the one that I'm assuming all of you have had. I think everybody here is probably younger than me. Um, I've actually had both polio vaccines. Um, in grade 10, I had the, the oral polio vaccine. And I remember it because it was so exciting to not get the shot, right? And um, it, it, I don't know what was in it, something sweet. It tasted like sugar, um, maybe a little gel or something like that. They put it in your mouth and you just swallow it. And that was the end of the story. And one of the things I learned is, is um, it was discontinued shortly after that and everyone, they switched to the injectable polio vaccine. I'm going to talk about polio in a few minutes and why they switched. Um, we'll get there eventually. Um, but there's a whole bunch of these, hepatitis A, rabies, uh, and like I said, that's another one of the old strategies for making a vaccine. And so these things make sense, right? You've got something that is the pathogen, but it's not going to hopefully make you that sick, if, if, if sick at all, right? And so that's good. Um, Modern methods. So one of the modern methods is why inject the whole pathogen, right? Um, why risk that? Why not just, you know, that one component that is um, 
um, going to be important for the immune response. So there's a whole bunch of vaccines like this. You can see some examples there, hepatitis B, HPV, um, 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 some of the COVID vaccines, not the ones in Canada, um, have used this strategy. So you're just using, let's say, the spike protein or a carbohydrate found on the surface of that organism. So the pneumovax, uh, um, uh, pneumococcal uh, uh, vaccines are doing this. So pneumococcal vaccines are for uh, streptococcus pneumonia. And uh, rather than doing the killed strategy or the attenuated strategy, they, they just have those carbohydrates. So you can extract them, purify them. I'm not exactly sure how they do that. And, and that's what you're injecting into the person is just the carbohydrate that's found on the surface, um, the caps, capsule of the, of the organism. Uh, you can see this one here is called, uh, I'm not sure what PCV stands for, pneumococcal something, something, vaccine uh, 13. There's another one, 23. That tells you how many antigens there, that are in that formulation. Uh, I had this one a few years ago. It was called pneumovax 19. So there were 19 antigens in that particular formulation. Uh, just going to take a look. I think there's a question or comment. So someone's asking, why did they continue the flu misc, discontinue the flu misc? Uh, I don't know if it's completely discontinued. I know I asked about it two years ago. I was looking into it, and uh, uh, I don't know whether that was the condition that year. They were finding it was less effective. So I don't know whether it's been discontinued entirely or it's just certain years they decide that it's not working as well. I know it's a lot more expensive. Um, I think a typical flu shot uh, costs the government something like four bucks, whereas the flu mist, it's like about 25 bucks. Um, so you can imagine if it's less effective and costs more, um, you know, should we, should we continue on with it? Uh, and in some cases, and, and like I said, I haven't seen it in at least two years now, and I don't know if it's been completely discontinued or whether that was a temporary thing. All right, so um, something kind of similar. By the way, I'm not going to talk about what is the difference between a subunit and a conjugate. You can look that up, but really the idea is you're just injecting the antigen and not the entire organism. Um, something that sort of fits in the same category as a toxoid vaccine, it is technically separate um, because it's not just the component of the organism, but it's a deactivated component. So the toxoid is basically you're taking the toxin and you're deactivating the toxin. Again, usually this is done chemically, and, um, and so the, the chemicals are blocking the active parts of the toxin, but you're still being able to get an immune response. So the two examples I have here are the diphtheria uh, toxoid vaccine and the tetanus toxoid vaccine. So in both of these cases, you are um, able to be infected by diphtheria, and it's not a problem because you are resistant against the diphtheria toxin. The diphtheria toxin, by the way, is um, kind of biologically something really fascinating. One toxin is enough to kill an entire human cell. That's how potent this thing is. Um, and uh, uh, But if you have the vaccine, then um, you're secreting antibodies that can neutralize the toxin and you have no illness. Uh, so some of us here today are probably infected by diphtheria, by the way, but it's been basically completely neutralized due to the vaccine. In fact, a lot of the bacteria don't even carry the toxin anymore. It's kind of been tamed, as we, as we could call it. Uh, so like I said, this is just an inactivated toxin and you have an immune response against the toxin. So those are the four classical types of vaccines. Uh, the first two have been around for hundreds of years. Um, the second two are more like since the 1980s, roughly. So we're looking at what's that, 40-ish years, 30, 40-ish years. Um, the last two types um, really have been in development for 20 years, but really only became actual vaccines in roughly 2018, and um, just in time for our recent pandemic. And I'll talk about them in a moment. Just want to show you, um, um, this is a list I was looking up Alberta Health Services at uh, all the vaccines. This list is not um, current, it's maybe two years old. I uh, just wanted to show you some of the vaccines that you may have had or be familiar with. Not all these vaccines, by the way, are, um, are part of the routine childhood vaccination program. Some of them are considered travel vaccines like yellow fever and hepatitis A. And uh, I don't know if Ducarol is on there. Ducarol is, um, 
is a traveler's diarrhea, mostly used for cholera vaccine that, uh, that you can get if you are traveling to an area where that might be the case. Um, but you can see there's, there's a bunch on there if you want to know where they all fall. Uh, often they have acronyms like DTAP, for example, is, uh, is um, diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis, and those are all toxoids. All right, what's going on again? Uh, the other thing I want to show you is some numbers. And um, this is something I always encourage everybody to, to talk to their grandparents um, about what diseases were around when they were young. Um, I, uh, I know my mom remembers all of these things in her lifetime as being um, hugely significant. I have some older siblings who suffered through things like mumps and measles. Um, and I've never seen these diseases in my lifetime. You can see these numbers, right? Uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, available before 1980. And a lot of these diseases um, have decreased more than 99% in some cases, which is just really, really remarkable. Um, particularly some of these diseases like measles and rubella um, were major scourges and actually huge fears of people um, getting them because of the uh, potential for, for severe illness. Um, there's a few here uh, on the bottom, right? These are things that were available uh, kind of after uh, 1980, um, and the effectiveness uh, may be a little less, but if you take a look at some of the numbers, it's really quite remarkable. For example, uh, meningitis is on there, I believe. Um, that was on there. Hey, we don't have that one on there. I was just reading about the meningitis vaccine the other day, and uh, not exactly sure when that came out. I'm too old to have had it. And I have a nephew that had severe meningitis when he was about, I don't know, seven, eight years old. And um, I think he was also too old to have had it. And, uh, um, but the cases of, uh, of childhood meningitis have plummeted um, dramatically since the introduction of that vaccine. And you can see some numbers here from uh, this is, I guess, uh, published in 2006. So I'd, I'd like to find some newer numbers, but I couldn't, couldn't find them. Um, they're all in one uh, research paper. So the last two types of vaccines I want to talk about, like I said, are super new. Um, both of them were basically uh, became a thing in 2018. And both of them, actually, the very first examples of these were vaccines that were developed for Ebola. And um, um, both of them, it turns out, uh, are very easy to adapt to other diseases. So the, the first one is called uh, nucleic acid vaccines. And if you had asked me five years ago about nucleic acid vaccines, I would have said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get there. Um, like I said, people have been looking at this for 20 years and um, it just, you know, um, it just wasn't working. But what's the principle behind this? Okay, the principle behind this is nucleic acids are genetic instructions. And um, so rather than injecting the virus or whatever, we could inject just the genetic uh, instructions and the human cells can make that virus part. So here's, um, here's showing an example of um, with COVID-19, um, we have these RNA vaccines. So this includes the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, right? And so uh, what we have is uh, in January of 2020, um, we had the, the first sequence for this new SARS virus. And uh, Pfizer, or was it Moderna? I think it was Moderna. It took them four days to design their vaccine. They had the sequence. They said, okay, this is the spike protein. This is the most likely place that the immune system is gonna have a response because it's on the surface of the virus. So they took that sequence, they made it into an RNA molecule, um, and you can see there's a few nucleotides kind of flanking the gene because RNA is a very, very fragile molecule. And uh, what they do is they have it surrounded in some sort of a lipid, and they don't necessarily tell you what's all in that lipid because, of course, that's a trade secret and all that. But the whole idea is the lipid is going to interact with um, the human cell membrane, it brings the RNA into the human cell. The human cell sees RNA. What does it do with RNA? RNA finds a ribosome and the ribosome makes a protein. In this case, it's the viral spike protein. So what you're doing is you're making the human cell into a factory that's going to make the spike protein. 
And now you can have an immune response against that spike protein. So the DNA vaccines, I think they've just not been having the success. Um, for some reason, doesn't work as well as RNA vaccines. Um, but uh, that's really the basic principle behind this. And you're getting a immune response against the virus spike protein. So RNA, this has a huge advantage. RNA is a super short-lived molecule. It's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, I kind of think of RNA like a sticky note, right? Um, you know, let's say, uh, you know, for example, I want my son to... Uh, I don't know, let's say unload the dishwasher. I could leave him a sticky note. The sticky note is super short lived. He sees the note, crumples it up, throws it in the garbage, and then does the job. So in this case here, same thing with RNA. It doesn't persist. Um, it just tells the cell, make some of these spike proteins, and then the spike proteins are going to um, elicit an immune response. And then when you see the virus, you elicit an immune response against the spike proteins. So that's kind of how those work. Uh, like I said, the DNA ones, there just hasn't been some success with those, uh, maybe in some animals, but not in humans. So somebody's asking, uh, are we going to have more RNA vaccines in the future? Are they too expensive to make? We are definitely going to see more of these. I'll talk about them a little bit in a few minutes. Um, they are so easy to make. All you need is the genetic sequence. You don't need some crazy biosafety lab to grow up the virus. Um, and uh, it's very easy to adapt. And actually right now, Moderna and Pfizer have a whole bunch in clinical trials. They're trying new flu vaccines. There's a multiple sclerosis vaccine, a rheumatoid arthritis vaccine I was reading about. There's a couple of HIV vaccines all in stages of development using this technology because it's so easy to produce. Um, and that's why these ones were kind of the first on the shelf because uh, they're super easy to produce. Um, so a little bit more on that. I want to talk about the last type of vaccine. Last type are these viral vector vaccines. And so this includes the, um, the other two COVID-19s in Canada. Um, we have the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine and we have the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine. So what is a viral vector vaccine? It's kind of similar to the nucleic acid vaccines, except for in this case, you're using an actual virus to deliver the nucleic acid. So kind of sounds scary, but um, it's not that bad. Usually what you're doing is you're taking some sort of engineered harmless virus. In the case of AstraZeneca, they're actually using a chimpanzee adenovirus. So why a chimpanzee adenovirus? Well, adenoviruses generally are, are benign. They cause like cold-like symptoms. But if you use a chimpanzee one, then it's, it's good enough to start the infection of a human cell, but doesn't cause any illness because it's not a human virus. But it's good enough to deliver that DNA to the cell. So in the case of, um, of both of these, of these vaccines, they're actually uh, delivering DNA, and that DNA codes for the spike protein. So it's very similar to the nucleic acid vaccines. They're just slightly more complex because it actually does involve growing up an actual virus, but usually it's a um, in all these cases, it's a harmless virus, at least harmless to humans, and they've, they've recoded it to deliver, um, like I said, the spike protein um, instructions to our human cells. So these new technologies are pretty cool. Like I said, in terms of um, the ease and how easy it is to reprogram them for something else um, is, is really quite incredible. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, thinking this is gonna be kind of the whole future of vaccines. So there's kind of a summary chart, right, in terms of uh, talking about some of these vaccines. Um, one of the huge advantages of the classic attenuated method is those vaccines often are less likely to need booster shots. Um, when you're using dead things, um, they're not persisting in your system. And uh, depending on the actual vaccine uh, and the studies, because sometimes we don't know how long the immunity lasts, uh, the, uh, the question is when you might need a booster. All right, so the tetanus shot, I can't remember, it's five or 10 years, for example, um, is, is when it's recommended that people get their booster shot. In other cases, uh, again, like I said, it kind of just depends on what the studies are doing. So there's this huge, huge debate right now around the COVID-19 vaccines, you know, in that uh, boosters have been approved, but do we need them? And we don't know. We haven't, this thing hasn't been around long enough. Um, so they're kind of recommending boosters for people with weak immune systems. So that usually means old people. 
Um, and uh, just in case, I think there's a big trial going on in Israel right now. And is it Germany or the Netherlands? Somewhere else, they're kind of putting, doing a, a clinical trial of trying to understand whether it's required or not. Uh, trying to understand long-lived immunity is very complex. Um, there's all sorts of studies that can look at antibody levels in the blood, but it's normal for antibody levels to drop. Um, we do know with COVID-19 that six months after you've been infected or six months after you've been vaccinated, you are, you are more likely to get infected. But then the real question is, are you more likely to get severe disease? And the answer is probably not. Um, and like I said, that it takes time for us to really understand the nuances of these kind of things, you know, because if you take a look at someone's age, you take a look at their, you know, think about all the, all the different types of statuses we've all had in terms of our vac vaccination. Some people have had their booster two weeks after the initial shot. Uh, if you're like me, I had the AstraZeneca and then the Pfizer, right? So, I mean, what kind of immunity am I getting compared to somebody who's had two Pfizer's or two AstraZeneca's? Right, so it's it's relative. It's a very complex uh, question, and it's going to take us a few years to really fully understand it. Um, I think the thing that amazes me is how passionate some people are about, you know, whether you need the booster or whether you know it's it's a crime to say we need a booster. Um, my answer is we just I don't we're not there yet, right? Um, you know, probably a good idea for people with weak immune systems. Um, whether we really need them or not, um, you know, we'll see what the what the data shows over the years. Um, it's the same with any any uh, new vaccine. Um, most of you are probably young enough to have had the chickenpox vaccine when you're a child. Um, maybe not. Uh, how long is immunity for that? Right? We think it's about 20 years. Maybe it's 50 years. It's going to take that amount of time for us to really know. Um, you know, some of you are probably, like, I'm looking at thinking about my oldest son was actually, um, I think he was, it was not available when he was a baby. Uh, just can't remember whether he actually had it or not. I think he did eventually get it when he was like five or six. Um, so, you know, we'll see, right? In terms of that immunity, are we gonna recommend people get the booster when they're 50 so they don't get shingles or like, I mean, we don't know, right? It's gonna take time for these kind of things to understand. Okay, where are we with time? Uh, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, this was just my summary slide. I talked about all these a little bit already in terms of, uh, you know, the four that are approved in Canada, I think there are um, something like 12 that have been approved by the World Health Organization uh, using, in some cases, different strategies. Uh, you know, different countries have, um, have a, a, a attacked this with different strategies, and uh, different countries have approved different vaccines. Um, in, uh, for example, the AstraZeneca vaccine has been approved in um, Canada, but not approved in the States. So why is that? Because the Americans felt they didn't need it. It was actually developed in the United Kingdom and um, it wasn't something that they invested in and, uh, and, and never brought it in as, as something that they felt they needed. Um, some of these vaccines, three of them have now been fully approved in Canada, meaning they've gone through um, the data, enough people have been vaccinated and they've decided they can give it full approval and, you know, it's been removed from that experimental status or whatever it is. And, and of course, once that happens, they have to give it an official name. And you can see here's the marketing that comes in. I thought these were some interesting names. For example, the Pfizer vaccine uh, is Comirnaty, <laughs> right? So you see how they're kind of, they're trying to, they throw RNA in there and they're trying to put community and they're trying to, you know, give you something kind of interesting there. A lot of vaccines have vax in them. So spike vax, that's what Moderna went with. That's kind of a classic way to name things. Um, AstraZeneca, Vaxzevria. So anyway, those names have all been released as their official names now that they're fully approved. Uh, the, the Johnson Johnson vaccine is the, the one dose one we keep hearing about once in a while, um, not at the fully approved uh, status yet. And, uh, and there's some numbers, and I think Pfizer actually, I forgot to revise this, literally on Friday, Pfizer was approved in Canada for ages five and up. And so I imagine that that's going to be rolled out um, sometime in the, in the near future. Um, 
So someone's asking about the Sinovac vaccine. Uh, I'm not sure which one that was. That might be the Chinese one. If that's the Chinese one, then it is an attenuated virus. Um, I'm not sure. I have to look that one up. There's a whole bunch of these uh, vaccine tracker websites. There's even more that are in different stages of development that have not been approved yet. Um, and uh, presumably that, that list will get longer, maybe not necessarily in Canada, but in other countries that are a little bit behind. Uh, some countries, you know, Canada was very fortunate in that, um, you know, we uh, 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 didn't necessarily develop our own vaccines, but we uh, invested in the right companies, thankfully. Uh, we gave Pfizer and AstraZeneca um, a lot of money up front, and, and they were actually some of the ones that were able to produce some of the early vaccines. Um, and other countries have different stories. Australia is behind the game um, in terms of vaccination status because uh, uh, they had a couple of contenders uh, they were developing locally that didn't work out. And so uh, they end up be behind the game in this whole thing. Okay, so. Okay, so I just wanted to um, uh, kind of talk a little bit more about these vaccines, uh, just to give you guys some question and answer type things. If you have any additional questions, just let me know. Um, first question about these vaccines, a lot of people say is they, they skipped a bunch of steps, right? You know, they skipped all the animal trials and the safety and things like that. And that's actually not true. Um, Canada in particular has one of the most stringent, strict um, drug and vaccine approval programs on the planet. And um, so how did, they, how did they do things so fast? Well, first of all, like I said, this vaccine platform had actually become available uh, in 2018. So it was easy to produce the vaccine. And the way you speed things up is you spend billions of dollars. Um, generally, the way clinical trials work is you do your animal studies, and then you get the data, and you look at it for six months, and then you put an application into the government to do human trials, and the, and the government sits on it for six months, and it's like a year later before you even do the, the phase one clinical trials. And then eventually, one or two years later, you get into the phase two clinical trials, and then eventually you get into those phase three clinical trials. And kind of from animal testing to um, the phase three clinical trials, a typical timeline is about three to four years generally because of all that red tape and all that time. Like you're not going to go into humans until you've had the time to you know, fully analyze that uh, animal data in terms of safety and all that. And you're not going to go from the phase one is, is, is low number safety trials. And, and you're not going to produce uh, thousands of doses of an expensive um, substance uh, to do large phase clinical trials uh, unless you know it worked. Uh, so the way that they ex uh, accelerated this is the government said, we're going to approve this. We're going to look at the data now. We're not going to sit on it for six months. Also, what we're going to do is get everything ready for the next step so that the second that approval is done, we can start the next day. And so that's kind of the way things were done. And this costs huge amounts of money. Like I said, recruiting, uh, in the case of the phase three clinical trials, recruiting 60,000 uh, volunteers, um, getting vials, uh, uh, clinics, those kind of things. You're looking at uh, this is costing hundreds of millions of dollars to do that and not even sure if you're going to make it to that step. And that's kind of what they had done for this. There's a lot, uh, a lot more I could say about this, but it's very, very interesting process and in how this kind of thing is done. Um, let's try this in front of my lap. All right, number two, 95% effective. What does that mean? If you look at the Pfizer trial, um, it was 43,000 uh, people they tested. Uh, uh, pretty much half of them were the placebo. So they were getting an injection just with saline. Half of them were getting an injection with the vaccine. If you look at the numbers, uh, 162 cases of COVID-19, of which only eight cases were in the vaccine group. So if you do the math, that's 95% of the cases were in the control group versus 5% in the, in the vaccine group. So that's where those numbers come from. Uh, another thing people talk about is this, is it, you know, we're injecting nucleotides into our bodies. Are we going to become sort of mutant, some sort of mutant freak? The answer is no. Um, this is not how these things work. Um, this is a not te a technology that is going to mutate your DNA. 
Uh, it's not a retrovirus or anything like that where it gets integrated or anything like that. Nothing, nothing crazy like that is happening. And uh, number three, um, do these vaccines affect pregnancy or fertility? Uh, it's really hard for me to not um, think about this particular uh, question and to think about all of the internet conspiracy theories that are out there. Um, but that's really what this one here is. Um, it turns out that there is a, uh, 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 some similarities between um, a protein that's found in the human placenta and um, viral, um, some viral proteins. Um, it, but, you know, the similarities aren't that deep. Uh, so earlier on, somewhere in the process, somebody suggested that this could be a concern, um, and it was never found to be a concern, right? And it's the kind of thing that has just ran wild with people being very concerned about this. If you take a look at fertility, um, you know, one of the side effects of having COVID-19 for some men actually has been erectile dysfunction. Um, there was, um, uh, trying to think of the organization of the states, um, urologists of America or something actually had a commercial on about this, trying to tell people, men, time to protect your manlyhood, get the shot, because uh, they were talking about this, it, it, you know, exact issue. Um, so, like I said, this is something that is totally not true, you know, and one of those things out there that has hit the internet by storm, because people are concerned about these sites. So another question is, what about natural immunity? What if I've had COVID-19 already? Um, you're going to have some immunity for sure. Uh, the data actually shows that the vaccines are giving us better immunity in most cases than people who have actually been infected. So why is that? Um, part of it is we don't know. Part of it is that um, when you get infected by COVID-19, different people are getting different kinds of infections. Some people are getting mostly nasal upper respiratory infections. Some people are getting deep infections. Um, and uh, if you think about it, your nose does not have as many immune cells as when you get an actual injection. And so when you get an actual injection, you're actually priming a lot more immune cells and getting a much stronger, robust immunity to something like this. Um, again, some of it's not fully understood. And there are some countries that are allowing people to have uh, not necessarily vaccine cards, but immunity cards, they're calling them. Um, but how do you test this, right, in terms of the population, in terms of who is immune for how long and those kind of things. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting thing to think about long term, but what the answers are going to be to that. How long will immunity last? We know at least six months. Um, uh, the best data right now is showing that uh, uh, six months after you've, you've had the illness or you've been, you've been vaccinated, um, there does seem to be uh, a more likelihood of being infected. Not necessarily getting sick, but actually being infected. So some people are being infected more likely after six months, um, but the immunity seems to be protecting them against hospitalization and severe illness at least. Uh, in, in terms of you know, how robust this, is this immunity is going to be, are we going to need booster shots every annually, every five years, all those kind of things? These are questions that is going to take us 10 years to sort out. Uh, but it is, it, is, it is something that people are talking about. Some people are freaking out about this, thinking that they're going to need a shot every six months. Um, probably not. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see, right? Like I said, in terms of time and all those kind of things, things are going to change and evolve. As more people are immune, uh, we're going to get less potential for having um, all, uh, new variants being produced and things like that. So it's going to be something that is going to take time for us to understand what exactly this means. All right, I think I have one more on there. Uh, what if I have extreme allergies or some sort of uh, you know rare immune disorder? Um, talk to your doctor, right? This is a concern for some people, right? Some people do have legitimate concerns in terms of... Uh, you know, whether they should be getting the shot or how they should be doing it under what conditions, right? Because um, there are some immune conditions that, uh, that are, um, uh, are, are, are a concern for people getting some of these shots. Yeah, so somebody's just commenting that pregnant women who get, are getting COVID are ending up with more potential blood clots and things like that. 
Um, and that is the case, right? And so I want to talk about side effects in a minute here, but are there any other questions about these? So feel free to talk to me anytime. I've probably listened to at least 500 hours of podcasts and spend an equivalent amount of time reading up on these things. So side effects. Let's talk about side effects for a minute here. Um, side effects kind of fall into three categories. All right. First category is the one that usually most people get is some sort of, uh, you know, inflammation or a little bit of pain around the, the point of entry. Right. So no kidding. You just got pricked by a needle. Um, you know, it's going to be a little sore there. That's called the inflammatory response. That's part of your innate immunity. Most people feel something. Um, I know when I got my flu shot this year, uh, I don't think I even felt the, the nurse touch me. It was really incredible. Some people just have the talent, don't they? To be very gentle. Um, but about 20 minutes later, you know, you could feel it. Just a little bit of ache in there. Definitely something had been, had been in there. That was it for me this year. Um, a lot of people get secondary uh, kind of immune reactions. And uh, this tended to be actually relatively strong for these messenger RNA vaccines. And uh, we don't fully understand why that is. Uh, uh, this year, like I said, I got the flu shot. I had no reaction other than a tiny bit of stiffness in my arm. Uh, I know another year where I had the flu shot, I went home and I had a little bit of a, I wouldn't call it a fever, but I just, you know, didn't feel quite right. Took a Tylenol, went to bed, right? Um, with the uh, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, I remember getting home and um, feeling fine. But the next day, I was just so tired. I think the one day I had a class, I taught class and then went home and napped. And that was kind of it for me, right? Uh, in terms of the side effects. So a lot of people do get side effects that include reactions by the immune system. And sometimes people think they're actually getting the flu or something like that, because you're getting things like fever. Um, sometimes people are getting chills, headaches, a little bit of fatigue. Generally, these immune reactions are a lot less severe than the actual disease. And for most people, they last kind of maximum of one day, sometimes two days. Um, with the COVID-19 vaccines, um, like I said, some people, it was, you know, they were calling it, what do they call it, the vaccine hangover or something like that. Uh, for some people, it was it was a really bad headache uh, for all day, one day kind of thing. Um, there are, in some cases, some rare complications for vaccines. Um, and there's a whole huge list of them. Some of them have been applicable to the COVID-19 vaccine, some of them not. Um, one of them that's, uh, I think, the... the um, it's about one in two million is allergic reactions. Uh, so sometimes people are allergic to components of the vaccine. For example, uh, some vaccines are produced in eggs and some people have egg allergies, right? And so this can be a concern. Uh, and uh, like I said, there, it's pretty rare, but you can get an anaphylactic shock. And uh, you know, so what do they do? They give you the EpiPen and, and they observe you until you're fine. Um, usually in those cases, it's a short-lived kind of thing, but it is, it is kind of scary. Um, with the COVID-19 vaccines, there's a few other uh, kind of things that have been in the news. Um, these rare blood clots with the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, uh, inflammation of the heart with the uh, messenger RNA vaccines, which seem to be more common in young males. Um, and, uh, and there's a bunch of other um, things out there, like uh, what's the other one I'm thinking about? Uh, uh, Humane Barre syndrome. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. It's kind of a partial um, face part paralysis. And uh, uh, usually it is uh, not permanent. I think there's been a couple of cases where it has been. So all of these things are things that generally, um, believe it or not, you're, you're in most of these cases, like the blood clots and uh, the heart inflammation, uh, you're actually more likely to have it with the actual virus um, and more severe. And, um, you know, in terms of the number of cases, right, uh, think about it, you know, we've got, what, 38 million people in Canada. Um, if the chance of something happening is one in two million, and we were vaccinating everyone at once, the chance of it happening is actually pretty common, right? If everyone, the whole country is getting vaccinated between May and June of this year, um, and the case is one in five million, we're going to have, we're definitely going to have a few cases. Um, your chance of getting blood clots being on birth control pills is much higher than getting blood clots from the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and, uh, 
you know, it's, it's all about the odds. And when you're vaccinating an entire population, you are going to see some, some rare side effects. The hard thing is to try to tease out, you know, what is more common in the general population versus those who've been vaccinated and trying to figure out how to control these things. But it's a, a lot of it is an exercise in statistics and uh, trying to outweigh, you know, looking at the risk benefit. So yeah, somebody's just saying a friend was given the vaccine um, after her first trimester with no complications or issues. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing. I mean, everybody has a different body in terms of what is going on. And as always, you know, talk to your healthcare provider if you have some sort of weird condition or concern because uh, um, everybody everybody is, is, is different. Okay, a few more thoughts on these things. Um, so just some opinions here, right? Uh, I think vaccines are amazing. I think, you know, it's been 400 years of, uh, of uh, you know, improvements for humans. And uh, you know, if you think about some of the epidemics and things like that, that used to be a thing and now are not, uh, I think vaccines are very, very incredible. Uh, you can see some of the diseases there that uh, I remember my mother talking about that I've never seen in my lifetime. My great grandmother died of diphtheria um, I've never seen it ever. I've never heard of anyone other than my great grandmother having diphtheria, which is really, really quite incredible. I think the um, um, these these new technologies are, are are pretty fascinating and uh, hold a lot of promise. We'll see what's going on, what's going to happen in the next few years. Like I said, uh, multiple sclerosis vaccine—that's kind of an incredible concept. We'll see if that actually comes. Uh, one of the other things that has really been, you know, 2021 will be remembered as the year of vaccines where it's been this huge debate and it's been politicized and those kind of things. And I think that the vaccine hesitancy um, has, has become a, a big deal. Um, you know, I don't want to call it anti-vaccine because, you know, the hesitancy is not necessarily a bad thing as it is, but I think at the level that it's become and, uh, and, and, and just in terms of all the craziness going on, um, just makes me sad. As a scientist, I hate to see science get politicized, and I hate to see false information out there. And uh, you know, some of the things that people say against scientists, right? I feel is directed at me. <laughs> um, and it's like, you know, I, I just part of me, I just don't get it, right? But anyway, um, it is it is an issue, and it's caused uh, a resurgence of things like uh, measles in some areas and, and, and other issues that have, um, you know, things that, uh, you know, measles was eradicated in Canada, you know, for decades. And now we're getting, you know, outbreaks here and there. This is crazy. Anyway, my opinions. If you want to talk to me about it, I'd love to talk to you about it. Okay, so, oh, one more thing. Yeah, I guess I've already said this, right? I don't like it when things get politicized. Okay, I want to talk about a couple other things uh, related to vaccines and want to talk about polio. I don't know if I'll have quite enough time to talk about polio. We'll see. Um, one thing that people have been talking about is this idea of herd immunity. And I uh, just want to kind of explain what that concept is. Okay, herd immunity is where if you take a look on the left there, you've got um, one person who's infected and only one person's immune. You can imagine how that infected person can just spread disease very quickly. But if you have herd immunity, herd immunity is the idea where a lot of people are immune either naturally or due to vaccination. And so spreading of the disease is a lot harder. And this is, you know, the goal or was the goal with COVID-19, um, even though in many cases it's practically not necessarily something that can be done. Um, with, um, with influenza, herd immunity, by the way, is about 40, 45% of people getting vaccinated. The, uh, the uh, flu just drops off the planet like nothing. Um, COVID-19 turns out is way more infectious. Um, and there's all these complications with asymptomatic carriers and things like that that are, that are making herd immunity a very hard thing to achieve. Um, so, you know, we'll see if there's a lot more talk about that. But that's the whole idea of herd immunity, if you've ever heard about that concern. So I want to talk about a couple other things, right? Why don't we have a cold virus vaccine? Because colds suck. They're really annoying. Um, well, it turns out that they're caused by hundreds of different viruses. Um, usually when you get a cold, it's the rhinovirus. 
but it could be one of those uh, coronaviruses that we were talking about. There's parainfluenza viruses, there's adenoviruses, and there's more. So we're not going to give somebody 200 shots um, to just get rid of something that doesn't usually cause any severe illness. The other thing is these rhinoviruses, they mutate just like influenza. They undergo antigenic drift. And um, so what are we going to do? Give someone 200 shots every year? I don't think so. Um, so this is not going to happen. And also, we're kind of just, even with coronaviruses, we're up until 2020, there are only two studies ever done on coronavirus immunity. Two, right? So you can imagine how little we understand about coronaviruses. It actually applies to rhinoviruses because nobody cares. It's, well, people care, but it's not making people, not killing people usually. So this is, this is something that happens. Okay, so I wanted to talk about polio. I guess I've just been talking too much today. Um, I want to talk about polio a little bit. Maybe I'll just introduce it and kind of come back to this next day and sort of talk about, uh, you know, the significance of vaccines for polio. Um, again, this is a, a, a disease that um, it's possible I saw someone with polio years ago. I traveled to Africa, but as far as I know, I don't think I've seen it in my lifetime, with one exception. I'm not entirely sure. But less than 100 years ago, this was something that was driving fear into people's minds. Um, every summer, or every couple of summers, it seems there was a polio epidemic happening somewhere, and kids were getting paralyzed. It was terrifying. Can you imagine being a parent wondering, okay, is a polio epidemic going to come through my town this year? Is my child going to get paralyzed? Uh, so this was kind of scary. Uh, we know way more about polio now since the 1940s. We know it's spread by the fecal oral route, um, which means it's very hard to control, right? Um, there's feces everywhere. Even if people wash their hands, there's still at least small amounts of it somewhere, right? Everyone has to go to the bathroom at some point. Generally, it's a gastrointestinal kind of infection. In some cases, though, um, it can actually leave the digestive system and start to get into the central nervous system. And this is where you end up with some paralysis. And so there's some historical photos of people that are paralyzed. And sometimes, you know, their bodies are a little bit twisted from uh, some of the paralysis. And uh, so here's some numbers, by the way, right? Uh, a lot of people um, are asymptomatic. Some people end up with a mild kind of typical average viral infection symptoms, fever, headache, you know, nothing too big of a deal. Um, some people uh, get, uh, you know, some spasms and things like that. And about 1% um, get paralytic polio. All right, so this is the thing that really scares people. There was, I was reading actually recently about a polio epidemic years ago, and there were, um, it was some kids summer camp 200 kids, and suddenly 20 of them were having signs of paralysis. Can you imagine how terrifying this, this was? Uh, in some severe cases, people couldn't breathe. They invented the iron lung. And so you can see this guy here is uh, the iron lung is helping him to breathe. And uh, usually um, the person would eventually be able to breathe again. Um, it was just they'd have to spend months sometimes in these, in these devices to help them. So um, 1950s, um, due to a lot of advances in cell culture technology, we came up with uh, a couple of different polio vaccines that were called the Salk and the Sabine vaccine, named after the guys who led the research projects. Uh, usually we are called the injectable polio vaccine and the oral polio vaccine nowadays. Um, the injectable is uh, killed, the oral, oral is, um, is attenuated. And uh, I'll show you some numbers and then I'll come back to this uh, next day. Um, 1950s, you can see parents were lining their kids up to sign up for these studies. People were terrified of polio. Um, Elvis did a promo to say, hey, he's getting his polio shot. Everyone was, this was, uh, this was big news back in the day. You can see this guy's being given the news um, because this was a disease that had no cure. And now we had, uh, now we had a way to prevent it. And uh, I'll show you some numbers here. Okay, uh, by the 1980s, polio was practically gone in Canada. Uh, I thought I had a chart here, but I'll show you some numbers. Um, worldwide, uh, you can see 350,000 cases. That's 350,000 
people being paralyzed a year in 1988. Crazy. Um, 1994, America is polio free. And anyway, 2002. And I'll show you some more numbers. 2012. I'll come back to that in a minute. But here's about where we are at today, right, in terms of polio. Uh, mostly, most cases, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So I'm going to come back and talk about, um, you know, some of the, um, uh, the good qualities of the polio vaccines and one reason why it's being difficult to eradicate. But this is something that I've been following for a long time is uh, polio eradication. And um, it'd be cool if we could see this disease disappear for good. Anyway, thanks for coming. We'll see you on, um, on Thursday and have a good, uh, good the rest of your week.